We are in week two of a series called Why We Gather. Why is an incredibly important question that people ask all of the time. It has driven scientists and researchers, medical professionals, philosophers to spend an enormous amount of their time chasing the why. And why has driven us to be better in many ways as a society Why is an important question, and so we're studying, hey, why do we gather as a church? And not only why do we gather, why do we pray when we gather? Why do we preach? Why do we sing? Why do we give? Why do we do that as a corporate body? Last week, we talked about why do we pray. I encourage you to go listen to that. It was a great time as a church, and today, we're talking about, hey, why do we preach? And my goal today is to help you understand that from the beginning of the Bible, when Moses first came down with the Ten Commandments all throughout the Old Testament, God's people gathered around God's Word. That was the centerpiece. When you get to the New Testament, Jesus as a boy was found in the temple unpacking the Scriptures. He taught his disciples. He returned back to Nazareth, went into the temple, taught them the scriptures. On the road to Emmaus, after the resurrection, he unfolded all of the scriptures to them. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, if you're new, we just studied the book of Acts for six months, and when you get to Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up six weeks after he denied Jesus flat out, He stands up in front of a few thousand people, many of whom were the same people that called for Jesus' death, and boldly proclaimed the word of God. It was the first Christian sermon in the New Testament. And then from there, you you have Paul show up on the scene, and then he's preaching in all of his mission journeys and planting churches, and he spends two months on his third missionary journey preaching in the hall of Tyrannus for two years, and it says the whole continent of Asia heard the word of God because of his preaching. And churches were planted, and for the last 2,000 years, Christians have been gathering on Sunday to hear the word of God proclaimed. And so today we're going to talk about why that matters. And I want to read to you out of the book of Romans, turn there, one of the verses that Paul wrote back to a church he planted in Rome And this verse talks about the importance and the supremacy of both God's word and God's messengers. And so let's read Romans chapter 10. I'll read verse 14 and 15. Paul wrote this. How then, he says, can they call on him, talking about Jesus, they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And the good news that he talks about here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God left heaven, came to earth, was crucified, buried, and rose again so that we could have life. Jesus is the centerpiece of scripture. And so today we'll talk about why we preach this word. And so, God, today I pray that I would decrease and you would increase and that you would help us to understand the importance of your word. Lean into it, God, and be changed by it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? So Paul is actually quoting a portion of Isaiah 52.7 where Isaiah wrote, How beautiful are the feet... And when Isaiah wrote that, he was talking about exiles, Israel, returning back home. They had been exiled for many, many, many years, and they're finally getting to return home. And Isaiah is saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who are coming home. Now, Paul uses that same verse, but he changes it just a little bit because the writer or the readers he's writing to aren't exiles in a foreign land. He's, he's writing to exiles from God, people who have been exiled because of sin and the fall. And he's saying how beautiful are the feet of those who bring new, good news so that the exiles can come home. When we say yes to Jesus and respond and are saved and brought from death to life, we, we get to come home. 
So Paul is saying how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news because when people hear and believe, they get to come home. They're restored into a relationship with God. It's not just that we get to go to heaven one day. It's that we get to come home. In this life right now, we're returned to a reconciled position with God himself. God's presence returns to us and through the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And in this passage, Paul is using a rhetorical device that shows how the communication of God's word leads to the salvation of God's people. So both hearing and proclaiming are central to what Paul is saying. Because if you have a chance to hear the gospel, hear about Jesus, then you have a chance to be saved by Jesus. And Paul's argument for this is found in the, in the verbs that he used. And I, I, I want to do a little grammar lesson with you. I want to see the verbs. You had no idea grammar would save your life today, did you? And so we're going we're gonna to look at the verbs. Look, look back at the verse. And I, I love actually looking at this verse in reverse order. And it finishes with those who bring good news. So that's that's the messenger. That's the herald. Those who bring good news. If messengers are faithful to bring good news, when they bring good news, what are they going to do? That's the good news. We preach that good news. And if we preach, what will people do? And if people hear, what will they do? Not all, but many. They will believe. And if they believe, what will they do? Call on the name of the Lord. And if they call on the name of the Lord, what will happen? They will be saved. So you see what Paul is doing here. If people bring good news and preach, people will hear. And if they hear, they believe. And if they believe, they will call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And so the proclamation of the gospel, whether it's in a corporate setting, which is mostly what we'll talk about today, or in your life over a cup of coffee with a friend is a divine and holy task. It's a moment when heaven literally touches earth, where the very words of God are being communicated through human instruments. So it's a holy moment. So when I stand up here every week, this isn't a TED Talk. This isn't an academic lecture. This is not a State of the Union speech. It's not stand-up comedy, although we love to laugh. One of our leadership values here is laugh loud and often. But it's not that. This, this is the eternal word of God. And so the breath of heaven are literally on these pages. So in the church, when she gathers... Preaching is that holy, holy moment every week when the body of Christ comes together. And so we want to open our ears and we want to open our hearts. And we want to listen to the inspired and inerrant word of God. Inspired meaning it came from God to us. Inerrant meaning without error. That's completely true. We want to listen to that through his word. Delivered through a... Appointed mouthpiece, as fallible as they are. And apart from God choosing to speak to us, we are lost and helpless and hopeless. And we don't go out and find God. God finds us and he speaks and he draws us in. And God has equipped some of his servants to communicate his word on his behalf. And so at the church in Knowlesville, we take that moment, this moment, very seriously seriously. We believe what Paul wrote to Timothy when he said this about communication of God's word. Be diligent to present yourself to God, talking about communicators, preachers, teachers, as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. So it's our job not to give you our opinion, but to tell you what God has already said. And so the messenger, the preacher... I deliver God's word, and God's word does, does the work. That's why on most Sundays, if you come back, when we preach, you're going to find our pattern here. It's kind of verse by verse, line by line. And if you're in a church and you spend the majority of your time just looking at the preacher and not at the word, you might reconsider another church. 
And so here we're eyes up, eyes in the word, eyes up, eyes in the word, eyes up, eyes in the word. Because I can't change your life. But God's word's been changing lives for thousands of years. And so, so we, we, we preach the word here. So I want to do today, in this series, we're teaching a little bit. And we're trying to help you understand why, why we do what we do. So here's what I want to do. A couple things. Number one, I want to talk about why we actually preach the Bible. Like, why do we preach this Bible? There are a lot of messages. There are a lot of things being communicated. But when you show up here at this church, other churches, why do we preach this Bible? 66 books written by 40 men over 1,500 years, three continents, all tells one story. Why do we preach this? Number one, authority. The Bible and the Bible alone is our sole authority in life. So look at the person next to you and be like, I don't got to listen to you. Now, husbands, be real careful in this moment. Be real careful. This is our sole authority. No one else tells us what to do. No one else gives us direction. No one else shapes our life. Our sole authority, we submit fully to the word of God. Paul wrote, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. He said this, quote, All Scripture is inspired by God. And, and I actually love the NIV version because it, it translates this this way. It says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. So I am fallible, but the word of God is not. And it is our sole authority in this life. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians when he was writing to them. He said, I thank God because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, listen, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is the word of God. So it is our sole authority. And you desperately need in your life an anchor, a truth. Because if you haven't noticed, we live in a constantly changing culture. And trying to navigate that is frustrating and confusing at best. Unless you have an anchor, the never changing, always and forever word of God to direct your life. And so it's our sole authority. And, you know, people say all the time, well, it's, it's not really relevant. It doesn't really understand 21st century. It doesn't really understand what I'm going through. And it doesn't understand if it meets this. And you don't know me. And, you know, and I always answer with a big Greek word. You know what it is? Baloney. <laughs> because for thousands of years... Culture has been changing and shifting and moving like the wind. And every leader, organization, culture that has ever stood against God's word is gone. But God's word remains and it will never go away. And so it is our sole authority, regardless of what the day brings and regardless of what culture would say is changing. We say, no, this is my authority. And my authority. So that's why we preach the Bible. We got nothing else to give you, which leads to my second point. It is sufficiency. This is all we need. The Bible is not just a helpful tool in your life, it is a necessary tool for your life. The Word of God is necessary because it alone is truth. Paul said, is the power of God for salvation. Jesus in the wilderness said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very Word of God. And so it is, it is our sufficiency. It's our sole authority, but it's also our sufficiency. There are authorities that people may have in their life that they, hey, they'll submit to, but it's really not all they need. They do it just sort of out of obligation, right? Like, hey, I'll do it because I have to, but it doesn't really feed me, but I'll, I'll submit because I have to. No, no, no. The Bible is what we submit to, but it's also everything we need. So it's both authority and sufficiency. It rules us and it feeds us. So authority, sufficiency, and last, clarity. The Bible can be understood and give direction for your life. It provides clarity to 
how to be a mom and how to be a dad and how to be a husband and how to be a parent and how to go across the street and how to navigate your work. It provides clarity for everything you need in this world. And it can be understood with prayer and time and patience. And part of why we preach through books of the Bible most weeks and we go through the Word of God verse by verse and line by line is the way we teach the Bible is helping instruct you how to learn and read the Bible for yourself. And so I'll often use a TV and I'll highlight words and we'll talk about verbs and we'll talk about stuff in the text. That's not just because it's my preferred way of teaching, although it is. It's also a way to help you learn and hear, ah, okay, now I see how I can go back and read and understand that. So we are trying to build a church here that is hungry for building their lives on the Word of God. Did you know that if you simply take notes during a sermon, you're more than 100% more likely this week to digest it, apply it, and live it out? Did you know that? If you take notes, you are more than 100% more likely to digest it, embrace it, and live it out this week. Guys, we are not wasting our time. We're trying to build a church here that is hungry for God's word, that says, I want to be changed by God's word. I want to take God's word into my marriage, into my home, into my life, into my school. I want to live this. I want to own this. So when I say all that, hey, write this down, I mean it. And matter of fact, I, we're probably going to start handing out journals every Sunday morning and inspecting them on the way out. <laughs> I'm not wasting your time. Don't waste your own. God's word will never return void, but there are a few things that you can do that will be transformative for your life. And we're building a church here that takes seriously the word of God because of the way it shapes our soul. So bring a Bible. You're going to read it. You're going to learn how to read it. Bring something to write on. Bring something to write with. It's going to change you. You're going to learn. So it provides clarity. And you can develop a pattern of understanding and dig into it more this week. So that's why we, that's why we preach the Bible. And so... When we preach the Bible, we talked about why, let me talk about when, we have several aims in this gathering. Number one, we, we want to give instruction. We preach so that you'll grow, that you'll learn truth, that you'll become disciples that multiply disciples, that you'll walk in the joy of the Lord, that you'll learn to reject truth. And as I said earlier, you will learn to be a group of people that can navigate a constantly changing culture with the never changing word of God, whether you realize it or not. Our world is desperate for a group of people with conviction, with sincerity, with authenticity, and lives that look different. Mike Glenn says all the time, the world's not mad because we're different. They're mad because we're not different enough. Living out the instruction that you see is the hope of the world. We're never going to elect or vote in the change this country needs. Do you know that? The answer is the local church. And so we're trying to instruct you in life. The Bible says, your word, God, I've hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Your word, oh God, David said, is a lamp unto my feet. So we want you to know this word, be changed by this word, be able to multiply the teaching of this word. And so we preach, I preach for your instruction. And I'm not just a preacher. The Bible would call pastors a shepherd, someone who has been placed responsible for your growth. And so we're here for you to help you grow. I don't share my opinions. I don't share my suggestions. Occasionally, if you've been here long enough, you don't go, hey, let, let, me, let me step away from the Bible for a minute, and I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on something. But that's occasional and rare. It's because we, we preach the word here, which means whoever is standing in this pulpit is going to have the same view of Scripture that I do. And so when other people preach here, don't be like, oh, man, you know, Wade's not here. No, stay home, watch online. Like, that makes me feel good a little bit, you know, appreciate that. 
but you're not here for me. And whoever stands in this pulpit's going to have something to say because they've got the word of God and they wouldn't be here if they didn't feel that way. So come ready. Come hungry. Come ready to be changed. You're not showing up to a life coach. You're showing up to the word of God. And whoever stands up here, like it or not, they're going to have the boldness to say, hey, thus says the Lord. Because honestly, whoever stands in this pulpit is far more scared of God than they are of you. And so with grace and truth, kindness and conviction, we will unapologetically say, this is what God has said and the creator knows what leads to human flourishing. We're going to follow him. And so there's, there's instruction that happens. And I, I love what Paul wrote in, in 2 Timothy. He said this. This is, this is what he wrote to his leaders. I solemnly charge you. Like feel that. Before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, preach what? Preach what? The word. That's what he said. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. And listen, here's why. For the time will come kind of feels like today, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. And they'll turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. So Paul said 2,000 years ago to Timothy, there's one thing you need to do, and that's preach this word in season, out of season, no matter what. That's your job. And as your pastor's here, like that's our job. One of the best ways we can shepherd you is with the word of God. In Ephesians, Paul wrote this. He said, he, that's Jesus, gave some, he's talking about to the church, the establishment of the church, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And this group was given to the church for this reason, to equip the saints, that's you, for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. So part of this moment is to help you grow into the fullness of the Lord. And when you are checking out a church, which I know many of you, this is your first Sunday here. Welcome home. We're so glad you're here. One of the things we want you to know about us is what we believe about the Bible, our theology. We can help you with that. And if you're checking out any church, we're not a high-pressure sales place. If not here, somewhere. But you need to know what they believe and why they believe it, because it's going to inform their preaching. And their preaching informs the church and will help impact your growth for better or for worse. You want, you want to know. So we preach for instruction. We also preach for uh, inspiration. Inspiration. Martin Luther said, to preach the gospel is nothing else than Christ coming to us or bringing us to him. John Piper said, preaching awakens new affections for God. We believe this is the greatest story ever told. And so you're invited to come and die to self, find Jesus, and live. We do want to inspire you into that life. If you've been here long enough, you'll know, man, I'm really honest with our struggles and my inadequacies and fears and all of my doubts. I am not a perfect person. I'm just telling you about a perfect God. And we're inviting you to come walk with us as we stumble forward with Jesus. We want to inspire you to believe that, man, no story is too far gone. No person is too helpless or hopeless. There is no situation too big or too small for our God. We want to inspire you with the stories that we share, with the baptisms, with the testimonies, with God's word to invite you into a better story. The reason why you're more tired than you should be, more anxious than is necessary, is because you're living a story that's not God's story for you. And we all feel that and we all know that. So we want to inspire you to, hey, come, come and see and live. And we believe God's word helps do this. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
And so we want to preach for inspiration. And lastly, we, we preach for an invitation. The, the, the Word of God invites you to a response. To, to submit your life to what God is calling you to in that text. To submit your life and your thoughts and your actions to what the Bible would say that day. And so it's our job to preach also in such a way that you're invited in to follow the teaching, not just hear it. How many of you, maybe I'll ask the ladies this, how many of you have ever thought, you know, my husband, like, he's listening, but he don't hear me? Any of you? Nobody on us to raise your hand? I don't want to start a fight, but you know what I'm talking about? Like, listen, he is listening, but he ain't hearing. You can listen, but not hear. So there's an invitation that says, hear this and respond every time the word of God is preached. And ultimately, we want you to hear that the essence of what we preach here is the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures. To respond to the gospel message of Jesus Christ, repent, believe, and be saved. And then to follow God's teaching, whatever it is. And as a preacher, I'm a witness here to God's goodness and the message of Jesus here and to the ends of the earth as far as my voice is carried through this message. And my confidence isn't in my ability or my rhetorical persuasion, even though I work hard on delivery and timing and structure. My confidence isn't in that. My confidence is in God's word because Isaiah tells us, my words that come from my mouth and my God's word will not what? So God's word says when it's preached, it's not coming back empty. It's going to make change. And that's, that's my hope. And whether it's my best sermon or my worst. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, God saves people through the foolishness of preaching. When Jesus preached sermon, the disciples preached sermons. Timothy and Titus were told how to preach sermons. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called both Jews and Greek, it is the power of God for salvation. And so we, we preach the gospel. And my goal is to preach the gospel and then die forgotten. Because God's message will always continue, but his messengers come and go. So I love this place, and I love you, but it ain't me. It ain't built around me. It's built around God's word. And your life desperately needs this. You cannot find joy or hope or satisfaction or peace without it. And some of you, like, came in on empty today, and I'm praying that God will give you some fuel today, enough fuel to bring you back, enough fuel to keep you coming, and enough fuel for you to, to begin implementing into your life some of the rhythms that we're inviting you to. Well, yeah, I've always been this way. I've always done that. You know, every behavior that you have in your life is a learned behavior. Did you know that? So don't tell me I'm just that way. No, at one point in your life, you learned to be that way which means you can unlearn and learn some new patterns. I'm inviting you to learn the patterns that God has said is best for your soul. And so here's, here's what I'm, I want for you. I want you to grow, and, and I want you to go. Be an active listener. Show up here. Take notes. Devour God's word. Come ready. God's going to speak. And then go home and sit in it, steep in it a little bit, grow in it. And then, and then go into your relationships and go into your places of work and go into your neighborhoods. Go and be the difference our world desperately needs. Go and be the difference maker. Go and be an agent of reconciliation. Go and, as Paul said, plead with others, be reconciled to God. He said, we go and plead as though we're pleading on Christ's behalf. Go. Go and be changed and be different. And so I want you to stand. I want to pray for you. I want to pray over you.
We are very imperfect and very messy people around here. We have scars and bruises and we stumble and we fall, but our anchor and our foundation is the Word of God. And so we're just asking you to follow Jesus as we follow Him. Prioritize God's Word. Come and be changed by it. And so, Lord, I pray. Pray for this church, your church, my brothers, my sisters, your bride, the church at Knowlesville, that that the preaching of God's word would be so transformative, so life-giving that we can't help but be changed. And I pray you would rise up into this place, people hungry for God's word, ready to hear God's word, eager to digest God's word. I pray that you would create a space here full of open Bibles, full of notepads, full of pens, full of journals, full of truth, so that we can grow and be changed and go as disciple makers. Lord, we plead for this, we pray for this, and we will work towards this here. In Jesus' name, amen.